teams. Also, um, some some people from my MPP class as well. That's great. Keep them coming. One more minute. So a little bit of update from Oxford. It's been really, really cold here, uh, but we, we're trying our best to wear a batik, uh, although with thermal underneath, so. <laughs> And here, if you see like the, um, the funny background we have, um, thanks to Leon, our team, who created like the background for all of, all of us. Oh, we've got Jovita from Jakarta as well. That's great. Yes. We can start. So, um, due to the overwhelming interests, we divided up like the different participants. Right now, we're also live streaming this talk on YouTube. So, yes, uh, we're very, very excited to have you here. Um, this is the agenda for today. We've got four points. First one would be about ground rules. Um, we would really appreciate if you can change your Zoom or YouTube username with the format your name and your organization or uh, the universities uh, that you're part of. Um, so like me, Ariane Santoso, part of Pepe, Pepe E. Oxford. And please mute yourself unless um, you wanna ask questions throughout, that would be good. But um, I will ask you to unmute yourself, but um, during the talk, please uh, stay muted. And the third one, this will be quite an informal chat with Ibu Mari. So uh, we will be driven by questions. So during the Q&A, you can type your question in the chat box, uh, both here on Zoom and on YouTube. And uh, our team will look at your questions, prioritize them and um, put them in like similar themes. And lastly, don't forget to capture uh, moments at this event and share them on your Instagram, uh, account. So three lucky participants will get an opportunity uh, to be contacted um, and to get ex exclusive invitations to our future event. Um, that's all for now. And right now we're going to have uh, Larissa, who is the president of Pepe Oxford, to open. And a little bit about Larissa. Uh, Larissa is a really good friend of mine. Um, who's currently pursuing a graduate degree um, in MBA, like an MBA degree at the University of Oxford. Um, she's also uh, currently a commissioner of Bear Greens, a sustainable fast food chain in Indonesia that empowers farmers and promotes healthy lifestyle. And prior to that, she led an agri um, startup in Indonesia. Um, she was the COO, Chief Operating Officer, um, that oversaw like the strategic and operational priority programs. And um, the more, most exciting thing was that um, she is the 2019 recipient of Forbes 30 under 30. So quite amazing. And in her free time, Larissa loves to go to supermarkets um, and loves cooking. So during the lockdown, she doesn't have any problem with that. So uh, that's all. But Larissa, uh, over to you, Larissa. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, or how you would say in Indonesia, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Shalom, om swastiastu, namo buddhaya, dan salam kebajikan. Thank you, Ariane, for the very kind introduction. Thank you to our viewers who have logged on for this talk from across the world. And of course, a very, very big thank you to Ibu Mari 
for kindly agreeing to join this talk early morning from Washington, D.C. To start off, I would like to share a bit on the background of how this series came about. A month ago, Arian and I, both new students at Oxford, had a conversation on how we'd like to bring more awareness and spark more conversation of our beloved country, Indonesia. I'm a big believer in the power of storytelling and in which meaningful conversations can lead to a more open and tolerant society. Hence the idea of Oxygen, Oxford Inspirasi Generasi, directly translated as Oxford Inspiring Generation. Our goal is to invite inspirational speakers with wide ranging interests and topics relevant to Indonesia. And what better and more relevant topic than to discuss how Indonesia can navigate through the current development challenges. In July, 2020, the World Bank country classification elevated Indonesia's status as an upper middle income country from previously lower middle income states. However, the development milestone is currently in jeopardy as just like many countries around the globe, Indonesia will, face, will have to face the economic impact of the pandemic. Experts predict that Indonesia will experience a demographic bonus in the next 15 years, which could result in either economic boom or bust. And this talk will specifically explore the important role of that, that the Indonesian youth has to play in the post-pandemic world that could help Indonesia navigate through the challenges. I am honored and personally extremely excited that for our very first Oxygen Speaker Series, we have one of my role models, Dr. Mari Pangestu, who is a global thought leader and managing director of the World Bank to share her thoughts. I look forward to this discussion, moderated by my very good friend, Ariane Santoso, a current Master of Public Policy at the University of Oxford and an Islamic Development Bank scholar. She has extensive experience working for local provincial governments in Indonesia and recently for the UK government. Thank you everyone for joining and I hope you all enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Larissa. And right now I'll write to read uh, not a, a but it's too short of a bio uh, because uh, Bumari has a really extensive experience in a lot of things, but okay, uh, I'll try to cover some of that. So uh, Bumari is now the current World Bank Managing Director of De Development Policy and Partnerships. Um, she assumed the role um, in March 2020, um, joins the bank with exceptional policy and management expertise because she has served as Indonesia's Minister of Trade um, and as the Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy over the span of 10 years. So um, she has had vast experiences over 30 years in academia, international organizations and governments working in related areas um, to international trade, investment and development in multilateral, regional and national settings. And most recently, um, Ms. Pangestu was a senior fellow at the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, SIPA, um, and as well as professor of, of international economics at the University of Indonesia, an adjunct professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and Crawford School of Public Policy, Australian National University. Um, she's highly regarded as an international expert on a range of global issues um, that led her to different high-level involvements at different organizations, including the UN, International Chamber of Commerce, and International Food Policy Research Institute in DC. Um, so I'm going to stop because even though we would spend hours and hours, we wouldn't be able to cover all of her great achievements. Um, so. Thank you so much for joining us, Bumari. I know that it's very early, uh, quite early for me, uh, 8 a.m. in DC right now, but we're ha very happy to have you here. And uh, the screen is yours. Uh, probably we can start with some questions uh, to kick off. And because right now we have very diverse um, audience with many backgrounds and different uh, interests. Um, many are very curious about your role at the World Bank um, and as well as the bank's current COVID initiatives uh, during the pandemic. Can you please share a bit about them and just give us an overview of the current initiatives in especially for middle income countries? Thank you. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, I think uh, Anna missed one thing about my CV that at some point in my life, I was also Ketua Premias in my own little uh, UC Davis. So I, I always appreciate uh, all of you who are who get active in student activities because I think I think it, it really is a very important uh, activity that all of you should be involved in. Uh, uh, what does the World Bank do? Uh, it has bank in it, right? So it, it is a bank, uh, but it is a bank which uh, lends for development. Uh, and so if any of you uh, are interested in development work, uh, th this is actually uh, the institution to work for uh, because it does lending. Uh, it, it, and it also gives grants and concessional uh, lending to the very poor countries. We call them IDA countries, uh, International Development Assistance countries. So these are the countries, uh, the poor countries get uh, concessional uh, lending or even grants. Uh, and then you have what we call IBRD, which is the International Bank of Reconstruction Development part of the bank. That's where the middle income countries like Indonesia uh, come in and that's lending at uh, not at concessional at not at concessional loan, but still at a lower uh, interest rate than commercial. And it's not just lending because we are a development bank. Uh, we lend, but we also combine the lending with uh, what we would call um, you know development advice or, or capacity building that is linked uh, to development. So a lot of at least the part of the bank that I'm involved in because it says development policy and partnerships. Uh, we, we work on the policy side uh, to work with governments uh, to design the type of policy that is needed uh, for them to be able to develop. So uh, this is all about uh, development and, uh, and the mission of the bank is uh, to eliminate poverty and uh, achieve shared uh, poverty, poverty uh, uh, prosperity. So it's, it's this dual mission. It's not enough, of course, to reduce poverty, but you wanna have uh, equality as well. So shared prosperity. So that this is all the, the, the work that, that I'm involved in. And uh, I think I've been preparing for this job all my life because I actually uh, st studied economics uh, and I studied uh, economics with a development focus. And then I ended up of course working uh, on development in my own country. And then I'm coming here uh, to see how development can be applied uh, globally and you have um, I think when you see uh, what, what other countries go through, I think we should say uh, in, this is a very Indonesian thing, right? Untung deh Indonesia, because if you compare yourself to, to other countries, you know, they, they have conflict, they have uh, more natural disasters that, that we, we experience natural disasters too. Uh, and they have political turmoil. There are many countries now in the middle of the pandemic that are having elections that are having, take Ethiopia, they're having a huge conflict. And then they also are experiencing uh, natural disasters, some of it um, caused by climate change related things uh, like Africa uh, experiencing a locust uh, problem affecting their food production. So uh, I, I think we are uh, in, in a relatively good shape compared to other countries, but nevertheless, uh, I think uh, in, in terms of what we, what we are doing in COVID, you know, I arrived here in March and then after two weeks, uh, I had, we all went uh, home-based work. So imagine trying to uh, deliver a program uh, two countries uh, everything based uh, from home but uh, somehow the whole bank it's quite a big organization with lots of country offices uh, we, we managed to deliver emergency uh, services uh, emergency support on health and social protection uh, almost immediately to 100 countries uh, in you know around four billion dollars and now we the uh, it actually total is 12 billion dollars because uh, the other thing, this may be of interest to all of you, uh, the World Bank also has the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm uh, of the bank. So again, it's private sector, it gives out commercially based lending, but it has a development purpose, right? So uh, that part of the bank uh, gave out lo loans to SMEs, for instance. So uh, we, we 12 billion dollars, 14 billion dollars was in the first three months. Uh, now we are focusing on the on the the rest, which is about 150 billion dollars, out of which 12 billion dollars is for vaccines, vaccines uh, so that poor countries can access uh, vaccines and get financing for vaccines. Because our past, this is the thing about the bank. It's been around for 75 
years, and it has a lot of experience from past crises. So in, in past crises, when you have a pandemic, unless there is, a, what would you call it, intervention, the vaccines will go to the rich countries first. Uh, who can afford it and who can buy it. And what they do is they buy it and um, you know, vaccinate, vaccinate their own population first. And then the rest of the world, uh, the poor countries have to wait for their turn. Sometimes it takes many years before it gets to the poor countries. So that's one of the things we're currently doing, how to make sure there is a fair and equitable access to vaccines. So we, we are about championing the cause of developing countries, as well as providing financing and, and uh, policy assistance to, to countries. And we do it in partnerships, obviously with the government, uh, as well as with partners uh, on the ground. We also work with C NGOs, uh, CSOs on the ground uh, to deliver uh, our programs. Maybe I'll stop there because I want to have uh, more time for uh, your other questions. Thank you so much, Ibu. That's very interesting because just last week, uh, also in my class, we talked about different models of vaccine distribution. Um, the one that you said about national nationalism, uh, um, like national model of vaccinating the their own populations and there would be like fair distribution. So very, very timely and relevant um, to our current discussions. And also since um, we are also focusing these conversations on Indonesia, would you also probably take us through uh, how you think Indonesia has responded to the pandemic and uh, what would be like the, um, it, well, if there are any role models that we can see um, in how countries respond to the pandemic um, and best practices that can be uh, duplicated by the initiatives um, of the World Bank. Uh, yeah, I mean, Indonesia, uh, maybe, uh, I, think, I think the key about uh, addressing this pandemic, as everybody knows, is uh, to address the health uh, issue. Uh, before you can uh, start thinking about the economic uh, opening up or, or recovery, right? So addressing the health issue is a paramount and a priority. But many countries, uh, I think including Indonesia, were a little bit late uh, in, in uh, doing the lockdown, right? Uh, because uh, of, of the concern about the eco economic uh, and social impact. So perhaps one issue was uh, perhaps we started late. And then we started around April, yeah, uh, when we started locking, uh, doing a very serious uh, lockdown, and it was it it worked well. To it, it kind of managed to below. I think it was around one thousand cases around that time, until about June, and then around June uh, we start relaxing again. So the other issue is uh, opening up too soon, um, is also a, another issue, and this is not just in Indonesia. I mean where I am, you know, this uh, US, the same thing happened, you know, open up too soon, then you have to lock down again because the spread happens. So uh, in June, because we opened up too soon, then you could see the, the cases going up, peaking in September. I think September was around 4,000 cases. Then, uh, and then, you know, there was some serious uh, attempt and then it come, came down again. But the last few, two, two, three weeks, it went up again. I believe the yesterday or 25th of November, at least the last number I looked at was 5,000 something. So it peaked again, right? So this, you have, you, you're having, so the question is, has Indonesia peaked or not? That's one question. Some people say, maybe we haven't peaked yet. So you have waves. Um, and, and that tells you that uh, we need to do a better job of uh, what they call the triple T, testing, tracing, treatment, yeah. Uh, and that is really the key. Uh, and, and if you can do that successfully, like we'll talk a little bit now, uh, now about other countries. Other, other countries that have been able to do this successfully, they open up gradually. And then as soon as a, a, a case breaks out or a spread breaks out, they immediately contain it. But the rest, which is uh, not affected, can continue to, to function more normally, right? So this is about how do you manage the, the lockdown and the opening up and in a very using very uh, good protocols. Um, and uh, I think uh, the, the key is, it's not just government. This is, uh, I just share with you, you know, we are looking at so many countries doing so many different things. The key is actually leadership, political leadership in the country. And you can see many countries 
including the one I'm in, <laughs> uh, where political leadership makes a lot of difference as to how you uh, manage uh, to contain or not contain and, and manage it. And, and the leadership is not just at the national level, it's at the local level as well, right? And then the role of communities um, to, to make sure that there's behavior change, because you know, no matter how good a government is, if the community uh, doesn't also get involved, then you also cannot solve uh, the, uh, the, the whole problem. So communities need to play a role to, to say, okay, here, here's somebody foreign coming in. Uh, they need to go to, into quarantine for two weeks, you know, uh, things like that. And, and making sure people wear masks, wash hands and so on and so forth. So um, I think countries that have succeeded are um, Vietnam. Uh, let's take countries that co are close to us, right? Uh, well, I, was, I looked at, at the number for Vietnam. Vietnam up to today only has 1,331 cases and 35 deaths compared to Indonesia at what is it 600 600,000 what Indonesia is five um, 516,000 with uh, 16,352 deaths right so Viet what did Vietnam do they already start lockdown in January. Yeah, and then they, they use, uh, of course, like Korea, like Taiwan, like Singapore, like China, they, they use a quite sophisticated uh, a a tracing using, um, using IT, using digital and so on. So I, I, think, um, I think that's really uh, the key. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is that uh, Indonesia hasn't done so well on that front, but Indonesia has actually done quite well in terms of responding uh, to the pandemic, uh, to the to the impact of the pandemic uh, on the social and economic impact of the pandemic, you know our cash transfer program because we have been doing it for uh, since two thousand five, uh, we could uh, 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 deploy it quite quickly. So uh, that has been quite successful. Uh, what hasn't been successful is helping the the SMEs, uh, providing them liquidity assistance and so, on, and so on. But this is this is the the next challenge uh, for the government. Thank you, Ibu. And also, um, just for the participants, uh, just to let you know that we've got pre-submitted questions that we would go into shortly. And also, please start typing your questions in the chat box. Uh, our team is now monitoring them and would be prior prioritizing uh, questions they are relevant um, as we go. And um, the, the explanation that Bumari just provided provides a really nice segue to the question around um, sector development after uh, the pandemic, um, whether Indonesia should focus on certain sectors to, to jumpstart the economic um, recovery. And also we have a really good question from uh, Walid Da, um, who's joining from Boston uh, around tourism in general and how it, it's related to um, the interconnected nature of uh, Indonesian islands. So Walid, if, you're, um, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask the question, um, please do so. Hello and good morning. Um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do this. Um, it's very, very great and helpful. Um, my question actually relates a little bit more to specifically the sector development um, of the, in the aviation industry. Um, Indonesia has multiple islands um, and COVID, especially with the lockdown and kind of like a consumer confidence, uh, the aviation industry has been hit very hard um, with a lot of the demand is almost like very, very low uh, compared to what it was in January or February. Um, and my question mainly is much more heavily related is that would it be more of something the World Bank would be focusing on or more of like the public sector? and trying to get these islands a little bit more connected, let's say, for example, with bigger cities um, to basically speed up the kind of like economic growth and post uh, COVID recovery. Thank you, uh, Walid. I think you have two questions in that question. <laughs> One is about connectivity in general, right? Uh, for a, an archipelago like Indonesia. And then the second is kind of more specifically on aviation within that connectivity. So let's talk about the broader issue of connectivity. Um, uh, you know, when I was Minister of Trade, actually, um, actually uh, with World Bank, um, World Bank assistance, 
you know, that was probably back in 2008 or 2009. Uh, uh, we, we, we came up with the co concept of connectivity and kind of, um, you know, a blueprint for, uh, for, for logistics in Indonesia. You know, but it wasn't just aviation, obviously, because you know you need to. It's multi -mod model, uh, model uh, is what would you call it, because it, because we are so we you know uh, we 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 had lots of studies looking at uh, the the cost and benefit of do of using uh, shipping versus uh, airline versus uh, also road and railway. You know so. Uh, and it was actually, uh, you know, this is the thing about the World Bank. They have what, what we call a lot of knowledge product. There was a world, de uh, world Development Report. I don't know how familiar you are with the World Bank, but every year we come up with this major uh, report on development. And in 2008, I think there was a World Development Report on the economics of geography and development, right? So that it was exactly that point, uh, you know, how, how connectivity uh, is the key to, to development because if you're not integrated um, as, as a country uh, economically, how can you uh, develop uh, the whole country? You know, you will have remote, you will have uneven development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we actually looked into it quite closely, and it's actually very complicated in Indonesia <laughs> because you have uh, you know you have issues of um, uh, inefficient uh, uh, shipping uh, regulations you know, uh, that doesn't allow uh, efficient uh, companies to, to emerge. You have lots of regulations, you know, uh, inter-island is regulated, you only can be, use uh, domestic ships, uh, only international uh, uh, sh shipping can, you can, uh, the international players can come in. So then you, you have like a, a break, right? Goods come in internationally, but then when it goes domestically, you have to use the inter-island transportation. It's a protection, protection for the for the local uh, shipping companies, but that makes it very inefficient. So we we kind of look at that, and then you have all the the regulations, uh, inter interprovincial, inter uh, inter inter uh, island uh, regulations. Uh, so uh, it it has to be uh, also fixed. Then you have the infrastructure issue the ports, you know, uh, I, actually we only have one uh, port that is privately run, uh, Hutchinson, the one in, in uh, Jakarta, but even they have lots of problems. So, you know, uh, reforms around um, uh, how you, you, you have the infrastructure and, and the, um, uh, the, 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 not just building it, but operating it, <laughs> okay, and managing it. And, uh, and one interesting uh, reform that actually the, the, the current government is doing is, I don't know whether you've heard of the Sovereign Wealth Fund. So the Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, that they have just launched, um, it's actually an Indonesia fund. They want to sell off some of the assets. It's, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the fund will have assets of state-owned enterprises that they will actually um, uh, get private investors to come in, which is, I think, a good thing. Uh, it's still owned by the state, but you, you will get a private investor come in and the private investor is someone, say, like specializing in airports. So they also manage it, uh, invest and manage it. This is the example is New Delhi Airport. You know, it's still owned by the government, but uh, I forget the name of the company, G GVC or something like that. They came in and then they invested and they also managed the airport. Right. So this is the kind of model that, that we need to have to make everything more efficient. On aviation itself, I think it's not just the 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 air the aircrafts itself, but I mean the the airlines itself, but also the the airports. And um, you know, uh, every every single bupati wants to have an airport in their <laughs> in their <laughs> district. Uh, and this happened also in China. Yeah, you have lots of airports that are empty, right? So the question is, uh, how do you design airports that, um, that can uh, actually, that, that actually will uh, improve the logistics? And the other thing about, uh, this is my own experience, uh, okay, building an airport, because I was tourism and trade, connectivity was everything, right? You build an airport, but if there's no road going to the airport, what's the use of the airport? So coordination, uh, and this is within the same ministry, mind you, Ministry of uh, Perhubungan, yeah? Ministry of Transportation. They have uh, darat, udara, laut, and they actually don't coordinate uh, very well. And I can give you a real example, Lombok Airport. 
um, uh, the, it was an international airport because it was intended to uh, boost the tourism in Mandalika. Uh, the airport was built, but the road to the airport took two years before it was built. Uh, Medan is actually, Kuala Namu is having uh, the same issue. Yeah. Uh, maybe the final thing on the airline itself, I think uh, we, we, we have Garuda, Merpati I think has, uh, not sure where Merpati is, <laughs> but I think we need to have, um, uh, probably they will need to be to be uh, assisted. Uh, you know, all all uh, all, con all countries uh, that have still have national airlines. At the end of the day, I think I think we will have to have some restructuring uh, of the because they're all they've all really in bad shape uh, because of no business. Um, so they they will need to be supported. But within that support, I think you need to reform it to make it uh, to so it can function better. And I think one thing I would say is that this was an example we heard from Ethiopia, Ethiopian Airlines. What they did was actually very interesting. It relates to the vaccine distribution and the medical supplies distribution. So what they did was uh, they, they actually got a lot of business doing the, the medical supplies and uh, essential supplies and vaccine distribution. So maybe this is something that the government, you know, it's, it's basically the government giving business uh, to, the air, to the airline, uh, but it's also benefiting uh, the government program, you know, so I, I think in the maybe in the next one year, given that tourism is, is nowhere going to be recovering, uh, then uh, this this may be uh, one part of the business. And I think domestic tourism is and domestic travel is already recovering, that would be the other area. But how do you make sure that you have the, the safety protocols to make sure that you can have safe travel? Thank you, Bumari, very, very um, comprehensive. And it, it also, um, well, the question that we just asked um, is kind of related to the other two questions. Is that okay if you take two um, at a time? So the first one would be around the role of technology and data. So we've got a question from Andre Ariwibowo um, from LSE. Um, knowing that innovations is, is one of the key drivers for economic growth, um, at different levels in the country, how will the Indonesian government further support fundings and pu policy supports for innovative projects in the future? Um, that's one. And the second one um, about the financial technology and how the role of financial inclusion will be uh, or, or will play um, in Indonesia post uh, the pandemic world. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um... There are probably more uh, knowledgeable people on this call that can answer that, but I will try to give you my answer um, because we are looking at it, uh, you know, globally as well as I think when before I joined the bank, uh, I also was look, I was also looking at the role of um, technology in Indonesia and how it should be the next source of growth. What we have uh, there are two things I want to share given the current situation. We, we do survey, we do firm surveys um, across a, 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 a large number of developing countries just to see what's happening uh, in the last six months uh, with the pandemic. And the findings are quite interesting. You, you, do, you have the expected, okay, firms are closing down, uh, reducing the number of labor. Um, sub, uh, within three months, the SMEs are the ones that close down first, the medium sized ones, um, maybe can last six months to one year. But what's interesting is about 25% have started to uh, adapt uh, digital technology, right? So, uh, and, and they have different uh, ways of adjusting to it. Uh, some are more sophisticated than others, but that's the key. Uh, I think one of the, the silver lining of any crisis is how you adjust and adapt. And apparently digital technology is, is one of the you know, issues just because you can't have face-to-face -face contact, et cetera, et cetera. People become very creative and innovative. Um, and so it's e-commerce platforms, it's delivery, it's, it's, it's uh, interaction. Uh, I think there's a lot of innovation that have emerged uh, because of the COVID. The second thing is the delivery of social protection. So cash transfers, uh, that can be delivered uh, through digital payments and mobile, uh, 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 the use of mobile phones uh, to deliver all kinds of uh, social assistance information. You know, the testing tracing that is also using, um, a lot of it is using digital technology. And there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of an accelerated demand from all the countries that we deal with. 
uh, to improve their data systems as well as their uh, the use the link of it to the digital technology. So uh, this is actually I think the the, the future. Uh, uh, the, the very near future uh, uh, of, of it's not it's not a sector necessarily, but it's how all sectors will need to adjust and adapt by a greater use of uh, data and, uh, and and technology. It comes with many issues. Okay, um, and uh, actually the next uh, it will come out in January. The World Development Report coming up is on data. Okay, so uh, watch out for it. Uh, I'll just say two or three things about it. Uh, one is actually um, the fact that uh, I think it's one billion people in the world do not have ID, a legal ID. So they, you don't, have, you're not registered anywhere. You know, you're born, but you're not registered anywhere. So you don't exist as far as the system is concerned. So one thing is, how do you register yourself? You know, uh, should you go and uh, self-register, or should the government go around and do a population census and register you? So that that's one issue. Uh, a lot of countries do do a combination of both. Second, once you're registered, can you have a, a unique digital ID? Because that's the key to digital inclusion, right? And uh, Indonesia, by the way, we are helping uh, Indonesia to hopefully start addressing this issue. Uh, Indonesia has apa namanya itu? IKTP, <laughs> but it's not quite perfect yet. Uh, and the the thing about uh, having a digital ID it's not very useful unless you can, uh, other uh, users can use that data, whether it's for financial, financial services delivery or social assistance delivery for education, for all kinds of purposes. For that to be to happen, you need to have confidentiality be protected. You know, your, your ID has to be protected, but protocols of using the data. And this is actually where countries like Estonia, um, even Estonia is probably the best example where they've actually managed to, to digitize everything. Even India with digital ID, I thought India would be like somewhere up there, but India, everybody has digital ID, but, and they all have a, a bank account, but who gets to use it and for what actually is not very well, very well developed yet. So Indonesia is actually asking uh, our help uh, to develop this system. They call it the stack, right? And once you have that, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for all kinds of sectors to develop in Indonesia, including fintech. Thank you, Bu. So interesting because we just did a policy case um, at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford about the, the ethical decisions around yeah. uh, digital IDs in India, ADAR. So very interesting that you mentioned that. Um, so the, the theme of building back better, um, we've covered that a bit, and I think it provides a good transition um, to the questions about climate change. Uh, we have two questions. They are very interesting. Um, probably we can uh, just combine them together because uh, they're kind of similar from Noto um, from the University of Birmingham and Jamal from the University of Oxford. But probably question from Mas Jama would be quite, um, would be longer and quite interesting. Uh, so Mas Jama, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question. Mas Jama. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Ibu Mari with us here. So I'd like to ask you uh, two questions uh, related to the environment. So research shows that environmental degradation multiplies uh, the, ch the chances of contagion like coronavirus and other um, diseases. But why in um, National Fiscal Recovery Program, there is no single point regarding to the uh, green economy or environmental recovery. Um, so it seems that uh, building better is not the priority uh, of the government. And secondly, um, I realized that the um, economic development hasn't integrated the uh, natural and capital, natural and cultural capital uh, measurements. Um, and sometimes because the ambition to improve the economic development 
um, is uh, dominant. So the natural and cultural assets are being taken for granted. So yeah, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, actually, we are really trying to work hard to make sure that building back better, you know, it, it is always, they always talk about how a crisis is an opportunity for reforms, for doing a building, you know, if you have to build infrastructure or if you have to have programs, can you design programs that achieve both the, you know, addressing the economic uh, and social impact, mm -hmm. but also uh, address uh, more, uh, building back a, a more resilient uh, country or economy or system. And that a lot of that is linked to climate, uh, addressing climate uh, change as well as health uh, issues. Uh, and so we, we are very much actually uh, focused on that. And we have a, we have a target that third, at, at the minimum 30% of all our lending has to have a climate co-benefit, for instance. So we have to, to design our programs uh, in that way. But uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, natural and cultural uh, capital. Uh, uh, we, we also want to push countries uh, to start doing a, a nature-based uh, accounting, you know, so uh, natural uh, capital, count natural capital into your into your capital. Uh, the way you, you design your planning as well as your GDP uh, accounting. And that's the only way you, you will know that uh, uh, going, through, going uh, through a particular growth path, you get a high growth, but you are actually destroying your natural capital or even your social and cultural capital at the same time. And that will lead you to a lower growth, um, some, uh, you know, in, in the, in the, not in the, in the too long in the future, right? Could be short term, could be medium term. And actually Indonesia already has this kind of um, exercise. If, you, if you're interested, uh, the, the, your, what you're talking about uh, under the new climate, I think it's LSE, new climate economy, uh, Nick, Nicholas Stern uh, has, has a, um, a framework called the new climate economy with a number of others, including uh, ex-World Bank uh, people. And they have tried to, uh, uh, have a framework where you you count the, the destruction of natural capital, social capital, uh, when you are uh, designing your development uh, planning. And therefore then you know, okay, you, what you want uh, is a low carbon development uh, path. You get growth, but also a low carbon uh, at the same time. And uh, they are not trade-offs. This is the main thing. Growth is not a trade-off. Um, uh, with with uh, a carbon emission, you can achieve both. It doesn't mean that uh, having to uh, go low carbon, uh, you will have a lower growth. Uh, this is the the myth that that we have uh, to to address. And and actually, Indonesia is not in, not in a bad shape in that sense. We have a low carbon development initiative in our last five year plan. We actually have a greenhouse gas uh, target. The problem is more about implementation because it requires you to have changes in your energy policy and your food and land use uh, policies. And this is where the homework uh, is happening. And the finance ministry actually has what they call green budgeting. Uh, so uh, you, you have uh, the budget being tagged to projects that have a green uh, outcome. They even issued a green sukuk bond uh, we also have an SDG uh, Sustainable Development Goals One Fund. The problem is finding the projects uh, that you can show that has the lower carbon uh, impact and so on and so forth. But with, final thing I would say is that within uh, our stim fiscal stimulus programs, we are working very hard with governments to embed uh, climate change actions, and they range from you know, in building out uh, renewable energy infrastructure or uh, urban infrastructure that will uh, provide better public transportation and reduce pollution, uh, you know, like big, big kind of uh, projects all the way to uh, like improving seascapes and landscapes, uh, which will actually create jobs, right? It's, it's a very quite, quite labor intensive um, uh, program. You create jobs and after, uh, after these, uh, the recovery of the seascapes and the landscapes, the farmers and the fishermen will, will have better, better livelihoods because of better, better um, uh, land base and seascape to, to, make, to have their production and, and yields will go up. We also focus on fossil fuel uh, subsidy removal, agriculture, fertilizer subsidy removal, and repurpose it. 
uh, for uh, for more social and uh, and and uh, you know human capital related health or education related um, uh, policies. So it can be done, but it requires political will at the, of the government to want to integrate it uh, into into their program. Uh, one country that has actually been our model country is Rwanda. They already adopted na na nature-based accounting into their um, GDP and into their planning. Indonesia only at, at the moment, at, uh, we have the low carbon development initiative, but we haven't fully translated it into, into, uh, into the program, even though there are uh, some programs uh, like, uh, I don't know whether you heard, but uh, one of our fiscal stimulus will be to uh, what is it? Uh, re restore the mangrove, 650,000 hectares of mangroves uh, and it will be restored um, as part of the stimulus program that is related to that, what I was saying earlier, re restore and revive uh, um, seascapes uh, and landscapes. And, you know, uh, as a former pol policymaker, uh, how to get political will, you have to show that low carbon path gives you higher growth. It, uh, if you don't do it, you actually will get lower growth. That's the first thing you have to show. Second, you have to show that it's creating more jobs. And three, you have to show that it's gonna lead to a more healthier population who, who, who will be your voters. And, and it's actually you young people that need to, to, to make this point. The way Europe turned around was because of the young people. Uh, you know, you, we need, we need like thousands of Greta Thunbergs in, in our societies to, 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 tell, to tell the politicians off basically. I want a better life <laughs> and you're, you're burning my house, you know? <laughs> Thank you, Bumari. Uh, before we transition to the role of young people, especially young Indonesian students, probably two um, short questions uh, related to climate um, change, if, if that's okay. Yeah. So we have a question from Brigitta, who is the current uh, PhD student at Oxford. Uh, the question would be, well, because right now um, the World Bank's also focus on the development of vaccines and how uh, the, the pandemic, um, countering the pandemic uh, challenges and how does that affect the World Bank's budget on other programs like renewable energies? If, if so, uh, would you mind explaining them? And also uh, a very short question from my friend um, from the Blavatnik School of, of Government, Milos, would you like to unmute yourself? I think you're still uh, on mute. Yeah. It's good now. Thanks so much, Adrian. Um, so, Dear Mary, thank you so much for your time today. I have a brief question when it comes to financing the sustainable development and in general financing uh, financing the climate change, especially two two financial derivatives. One of them piloted by by the World Bank actually, the green bonds and sustainable sustainability bonds. So I'm interested to see your views when it comes to you know kind of future of green of green bond market. The second one is also in line with what the IMF and the G20 announced. Uh, debt restructuring of uh, low-income countries. How do you see the future of potential debt swaps, especially in the COVID uh, times? Uh, the future of the debt swaps, so basically low-income countries can swap debt uh, with the northern countries uh, to invest in their in their uh, development. Over and thank you for the opportunity. Um, the first question, the trade-offs between a health issue and renewable energy. Uh, you know, I think this is um, something that uh, well, every country will have to face their own trade-offs, but I, I think uh, we, we are prioritizing vaccine because uh, it is, if you, if you think about how the economies can recover, it is only through a, a proper program of vaccines. And uh, by the way, we are not just focusing on the procurement of vaccines, but we are focusing a lot also on, on the, pro, you know, the actual vaccination process. Don't forget, this is the largest, it's going to be the largest vaccination uh, program ever in the world, I think, because adult, it's normally children that get vaccinated, not adults. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the only other time this ever happened in the world was smallpox. Yeah, so uh, you, you, you have to create the infrastructure, you have to train people, you have to have a good communication strategy, and it's going to take time. It's probably going to take at least two years before you can really 
uh, say that you have the whole population vaccinated. So, so let's just remember that. And as you're doing that, of course, you want to be uh, uh, opening up, having economic recovery. And I think renewable energy can be one of those uh, building back better stimulus type of programs. But the important uh, footnote there is there has to be the reforms that allow the renewable energy to happen in any particular country. And it is related to uh, the price incentives uh, really, or even the carbon tax or carbon pricing incent incentives that need to be there to you know, uh, make, make it attractive uh, for you to go into renewable energy and, and the pricing of the feedstock and so on. And, and to the extent countries have state-owned enterprise monopoly still in the transmission and the distribution, uh, like in our country, then you need to have a, a good reform uh, there also. So um, it's not just about financing it, but also the reform. And if the reforms are there, maybe the financing doesn't have to, it doesn't need to come from the government. It can, it will come from the private sector investment, right? So this is really uh, what we are working on. Uh, to Milos, um, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, in building back better, it's not just about government, just like what I just said. It is about how do you uh, introduce reforms um, and uh, reg you know, regulations as well as uh, incentives and uh, sort of hardwiring, uh, uh, what, however you call it, uh, not hardwiring, but um, creating the, the right kind of a climate for, uh, for other financial instruments to come in uh, because what you want is private uh, funding, it's private investment to come in uh, into this space, uh, like green bonds, uh, for instance. We are actually working uh, a lot on this green bonds. We also have blue bonds um, uh, in, in, in the works. Uh, and it is about uh, you know, creating uh, the, the right kind of um, uh, financial uh, uh, structures, but uh, a bond is only as good as, you know, where are the projects that you want to invest in? Uh, that are green or blue, yeah? So structuring these projects um, is, is a function of government reforms, government regulation, government incentives, uh, and uh, your ability to uh, prepare these projects. So uh, we are providing, uh, we, 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 there needs to be some provision of grants or capacity building to design these projects so that you can actually show uh, you know the metrics of of uh, of the whether whether it's a, whether it's a CO two emission kind of measure or um, a social measure. Uh, there are also lots of projects that are designed uh, to show the social impact. So that that that's kind of the, the the big space that we're working in. And I think the other uh, uh, angle is uh, we are working on this, and and that's a big agenda for the UK in the uh, upcoming COP twenty six how to have private uh, invest, investors, banks, and so on, um, also uh, 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 have climate risk as uh, a part of the calculation, uh, not just financial risk and, and other risks, but the climate risk becomes uh, part of the calculation. And you know, as you know, lots of banks are already saying we don't we don't lend to coal-fired power plants anymore. Um, so institutional investors, banks, and so on are also uh, putting in, embedding uh, climate and social um, uh, dimensions into their lending. Uh, so uh, I, 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 I can say a lot more about that, but uh, we, we are working a lot in this space, uh, including what, what's called blended finance, which is a combination of, you could have a combination of multilateral uh, guarantees combined with a little bit of government budget or government assurances on policy and then uh, uh, grants coming in uh, to help with the pro project pre preparation and then combine with commercial investment. So there are examples of that uh, happening already on the ground. Um, on the debt, uh, debt service sustainable, uh, debt service suspension initiative. I'm sorry, you, you mentioned IMF, actually it was World Bank and IMF. Uh, we were very involved uh, in this initiative which is, say, which is basically then adopted by uh, the G20 to suspend uh, the debt service of the poorest countries uh, to give them fiscal space to respond uh, to the crisis. Uh, and, uh, and, and in the near future, it's, been, it's just been extended for another six months, but given past crisis uh, without 
debt restructuring and debt reduction, uh, uh, the, it, it's not going to be sustainable, put it that way, right? And, and the World Bank, maybe two, three decades ago, we, we, we helped to create the HIPIC, which was a similar initiative to restructure the debt of the poorest countries. We think it's gonna have to go in that direction again. Uh, and we are talking very, uh, actually debt swap, um, debt for nature swap is one of the dimensions that actually we are working on right now. So it's come back again. As you know, uh, it was very popular uh, maybe two decades ago, but even Indonesia, I think we, we only ever did 50 million. I, I remember I did some research back a long time ago on this, and I think it was only a German debt uh, of 50 million that we were able to do a debt for nature swap. The problem is it goes back again to how do you design the projects uh, that can give, show you the metrics of that and the governance around it. You know, as you know, Indonesia got $1 billion from Norway, I think about 10 years ago. And we only are, have only been able to use maybe even less than 100 million of that in 10 years because the governance of the use of the money as well as showing the metrics and, and monitoring that it is actually being used uh, for nature or for climate change. So I, a, a lot of that work uh, still needs to be done, but uh, qua ID, qua framework, uh, we are working on it. Thank you, Bumari. I'm so glad that many of the questions are related to climate change because it just shows how important um, the conversation about uh, yeah. environment is. Yeah, you know what we always say: uh, there, there are more people who have who have died or will die from climate change than they will from this pandemic. So. Don't forget the other crisis, which is climate change. Thank you for the great reminder. And we're gonna be running over time. Is that okay with you if we ask one um, final question? Sure, sure. sure. Okay, uh, another question from YouTube. So um, this will be about, yes, uh, that I think most of us here um, are studying abroad. Uh, so the question would be, what, what would you say to Indonesian students abroad or just international students that weigh in decisions to go back to their countries or not? Uh, because I know that you've contributed a lot to Indonesia, whether you're based in Indonesia or not. Um, so what were the different factors that affected your decisions, uh, whether uh, where you would be based? I think my main message to, to all students studying abroad, um, I, I say this to my own kids, by the way, <laughs> that you have to take advantage of, of whatever learning you can, uh, wherever you are. Uh, and it's not just what you learn in school, uh, uh, but you know, the networks that you build, uh, you know, the, the professors that you get to know, uh, do as many internships as you can. Uh, uh, because that, that's actually what I did. Uh, and, and I was fortunate that I had a father who, he didn't make me do it, but uh, he always uh, somehow, uh, somehow I was able to do good internships every summer. And I learned a lot. I learned that I didn't want to become an accountant, for instance. I, and I learned that I, I was more passionate about economics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in that process, I, I met a lot of people. I got a lot of network. And you know, it's just part of your learning um, and and then uh, and then when at some point you 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 come to the point where do I go home or do I stay where I am you know that's kind of a big question uh, I I don't think I think what what you would should do is keep your options open uh, you should uh, if you could get ex work experience or if you are doing research you know like in the academic track get research experience especially in the science field you know uh, it, it, it's it's great to be in, in, in either, I don't know where you are, whether you're in the UK or in the US, you know, to get that experience that, will, that you can bring home uh, to Indonesia at someday. And maybe you never go home, that's fine too. Uh, I have a brother who never went home, <laughs> uh, but he ended up, uh, you know, do, becoming a very good researcher in a university. And then, not, and then he went to join the WHO uh, so he contributed in a different way. Uh, and then now he's actually retired and he's actually uh, uh, helping also uh, some parts of the Indonesian government on health, health policy. So you can contribute anywhere you are, you know, and I actually wanted to not go home. 
I want when I finished my PhD back, uh, I won't say how long ago, <laughs> many decades ago, I wanted to join the World Bank because I wanted to work on development. And my father said to me, no, you cannot go to the World Bank. You have to go home first. How, why are you going to help other, other countries develop, help your own country develop? So I was uh, under a lot of pressure to go home. So I went home, I made a deal with my dad. I said, okay, I'm going home, uh, but if I don't like it after two years, I'm gonna go back uh, to join the bank. But you know, the rest is history, right? So I, I ended up uh, actually came coming back at a very interesting time of Indonesia. Uh, reform, uh, right, it was before democracy, it was like during the reformasi period. And I was I was glad I came home because I was I, I felt like I was part uh, of history. Now you guys are in a very, very interesting, um, uh, I guess, uh, part of life uh, and, and part of, we don't know what's gonna, what's gonna be the new normal after this pandemic, but you could all be part of the new Indonesia, which is going to be hopefully, you know, um, lots of opportunities. You know, the thing about Indonesia is we are a large country even though there's a recession and so on and so forth. I, I believe that uh, I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic about Indonesia in the medium term, because we have, we have the people, we have the population, we, have the, we, have, uh, we are blessed with uh, natural resources uh, as long as we can take care of them. So there's lots of opportunity for you uh, in, in all fields, and including, I would say, I would encourage some of you to end up in politics as well. Because the only way, uh, you know, we kept on, remember, we kept on talking about political will, leadership, and so on for things to happen. So you all can be in, in the different parts uh, of, of society. And, and, and final thing I would say is that I'm not a politician, but I ended up having to be, you know, in, in a polit political situation as a minister. The only thing that saved me was what I call evidence-based policy making. You know that okay, if I'm going to do a policy, I need to have the facts and figures and the evidence. Why is this policy good? Because it's helping uh, this group of people that I'm trying to help, right? And and that's uh, il your ilmu, your uh, your your analytical ability. Hopefully, will will uh, will bring you always to that to that very basic thing that uh, you can't talk about alternative fact, you can't talk about hoax, you can't be a politician talking in the, in the emptiness. You have to you know, always um, base your, your, uh, your statements and your actions uh, on, on evidence and, and analysis, because I, I believe that's, uh, that's the only way we can, you know, whether it's science-based or uh, analytical economics and data, uh, to me, that's, that's really uh, the only way we can have uh, a better world. Uh, and um, your advocacy is important. So you are, you are, you are, you've got the world in your hands. And I hope that many of you will contribute to a better Indonesia uh, uh, in where, wherever you are. Uh, so, so you don't have to be in Indonesia uh, to, to be contributing. Thank you so much, Ibu. Very, very valuable messages. And for those who have also agreements with their parents, you know you have a story to refer to. Uh, right now, I just want to thank you, uh, Bumari, uh, for joining us and for all the valuable lessons. For um, Pepe E. Oxford team, also Dini, who's been leading the team uh, for our uh, first speaker series event. Thank you for everyone who has spared their time on a Saturday uh, to join us. and all those who ask questions as well. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them, but very excited. And please stay tuned on our Instagram account uh, for more events. And right now, if possible, uh, can we please spare two more minutes to take a picture because Indonesians love taking pictures. And, <laughs> and Leon, can you please also um, just direct us? You have to do page by page, I guess, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or probably Dini is doing all the hard work. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, everyone, cheers. Cheers. Hold on, <laughs> second page. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And also for okay. those joining on YouTube, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Ibu. Good luck, everybody, and go and get them. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you so much for your time. Have a great one. Have a great one.